get started, and we'll see if anyone else uh, and that uh, manages to show up. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Mark Murphy, and I'm here to talk to you about securing your Android applications. Um, most of you, hopefully, have done some Android development before, uh, and that the if you haven't, some of the sorry, wrong, wrong point. <laughs> Was that something I said? No, 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 no. Sorry. Yeah. He hasn't done it yet. Anyway, unfortunately, that significantly reduced the size of my audience by a noteworthy percentage. Um, and that the uh, uh, the um, so anyway, I mean, the uh, if you haven't done Android development, and there many of the concepts that I'll talk about here, and that will be applicable to other environments in one form or fashion. Uh, and that though some of the technical implementations that I'll talk about may somewhat flip past your head, uh, and that the uh, and that so um, it, so it should be useful for all of you. The degree of usefulness uh, and that is certainly going to vary. Uh, a couple of administrative things, uh, and that if you could take your phones and put them on vibrate or silent or forward them to 10 Downing Street or whatever you normally do when you don't want to be disturbed, and that'd be awesome. Um, if you have questions anywhere along the way, just let me know, uh, and I don't feel you have to wait till the end. Um, and that the uh, this is being recorded, I presume. I've got a little red light showing at me. Hi, camera. Um, and that, and so uh, and that, so also bear that in mind if you do decide to, you know, escape somewhere along the line. Also, uh, and that you are all given thumb drives, which have a presentation on them that vaguely resembles the one that I'm going to be showing you here. Uh, but they asked for that presentation deck uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was editing these slides yesterday. Um, and that there is going to be a QR code in the short URL at the end for you to be able to download the actual slides that I'm going to be using here, which are both new and improved. But we're here today to talk about defending your users against the forces of evil. Um, and that the, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here will have other utility. Uh, and that, that you are you're worried about, um, you know, you've got uh, multimedia assets and that, that you want to protect using some sort of DRM-ish algorithm um, and that, or things along those lines. Some of what I'll talk about here will have some relevance there, but that's not really the point. I'm worried about our users because our users are awash in a sea of evil. Um, and that whether it is you know lighter weight things like your garden variety script kitties, uh, and that up to you know more serious concerns, some of which change over time. For example, I mean there was just an article in Australia's The Age. Uh, and that uh, just the past few days, and that talking about how spyware is increasingly being used, uh, you know, I mean, in domestic violence and other sorts of situations where you know, people are downloading the nanny cams and, you know, the track your children sorts of apps and that. And while the use of those apps for those specific use cases is reasonable, using that to track your ex stalk, you know, the celebrity, that sort of stuff, and that starts becoming much more disturbing. And of course, you know, a lot of people in that are going to be thinking about that last bullet, state actors. Um, you're probably thinking that I'm thinking about, you know, a particular group of five state actors uh, and that who've been in the news over the past year or so and that for uh, wide scale surveillance and so forth. Um, they are certainly state actors to pay attention to and keep tabs on what it is that is being disclosed that they are doing. Um, but there are other state actors, uh, and that beyond those five. Even if you think that those five and that are, are righteous and just in what they're doing, the notion that there are other state actors who you may not like nearly so much that aren't, you know, are also <coughs> doing those same sorts of things. Even if they can't necessarily do it on an international basis, they can certainly do it within their own borders. You know, just within you know, the past few months and that you know, we've had the whole you know, turkey banning of Twitter and whatnot and blocking things left and right, it's a short hop from there to being able to more surveil and you know, try to use those sorts of things to figure out, okay, well these are particular dissidents uh, and that, that we are going to pressure uh, and that because they're not as high profile we want to shut them up, 
in the Ukraine and then earlier this year, there was that handy little text message that went out to lots of people saying, hi, your cell phone was seen in the vicinity of a protest of the other day. Have a nice day. Um, and that, and it is a very short step from there for that turning around and being used uh, at that for rounding up people en masse. And so the, now, if you're writing the next flappy bird clone, uh, and that you probably aren't going to be panicking about this stuff quite so much, and that unless, you know, you're here to save the birds. Um, and that the, but there are going to be any number of apps where we need to think long and hard about, you know, how are we making sure that the user's data is the user's data and stays the user's data and doesn't become the user's and in other parties' data. That we are ensuring that their data isn't sniffed in transit, it isn't absconded with off their devices, it isn't, uh, and then modified. Uh, and that, you know, go in and tinker with that data in ways that might uh, negatively affect the user, such as, oh, hey, we're going to go in and we're going to load a bunch of child porn onto this person's phone and then turn around and arrest them for having child porn in order to be able to uh, set them up for a fall. The problem is that doing the security stuff is oftentimes not that easy. That QR code leads to a white paper published last year a bunch of academic researchers well, created a tool called CryptoLint. Lint, as you're aware, and that is looking at a code base and saying, okay, what have you done that is technically legal from a compilation standpoint, but probably not what you want? CryptoLint is focused specifically on common flaws in cryptography, such as hard coding the password. Um, and that the they analyzed nearly 12,000 Android applications and found that 88% of them were screwing up in one form or fashion in things that CryptoLint was able to detect. So look to the person to your left, look to the person to your right, two-thirds percent chance that all three of you have screwed up something, uh, and that with security. And so what my goal here is today is to basically try to point out different areas and that that you should be thinking about. Where possible, show you easy ways of dealing with those things that you should be thinking about so that you can do a better job and that of securing your users. If there is one thing you take away from this presentation, please use SSL. Um, and that the, uh, and that if, I mean, just do it. In part because normally it just works. You know, if you've got your web server set up, you stick the little S on that at the end of your scheme, and then and poof, magic crypto happens. The problems come in and that where it's not quite that straightforward. For example, you want to uh, have a test server somewhere, uh, and uh, you've got some sort of a self-signed SSL certificate for that test server, well, self-signed certificates are going to fail out of the box. And so you need to go in and do a little bit of work in order to be able to arrange to support those self-signed certificates. Your organization may be big enough that you have your own private certificate authority and that you're not necessarily using certs that are backed by some common root certificate authority, you know, your verisigns and whatnot of the world, but instead is backed to your organization principally for you know, internal use apps and things like that, your intranets and so forth. Well, those certificates aren't going to be valid, uh, determined as valid because you know, the Java slash Android code is going to try validating all these certificates and it's going to come to the end and it's going to say, but, 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 but I don't recognize any of that stuff. Ick, and it's going to fail. And so you've got to do stuff with you know, custom trust managers in order to be able to teach Android that no, 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 if for my app, these scenarios are fine. The problem is that too many developers go to Stack Overflow. And they look up, hey, how do I deal with self-signed certificates? And they see the answers out there that say, oh, yeah, you create that trust manager that just accepts everything. And you know, we completely ignore the incoming certificates and say, yeah, 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 everything's fine. Because it's really easy to write one of those. It's like, you know, maybe 10 lines of code if there's like, you know, line wrapping in that going on. But you've got to be really careful with that. Just in this past week, 
the U.S. Federal Trade Commission has filed suit against Fandango and Credit Karma. Uh, and that specifically for doing this, that they ship apps in production that totally ignore the incoming certificates, that they do SSL, but they wired up a trust manager that said, yeah, whatever, we'll accept anything. And, that, and so the FTC is saying, you know, that's not good, and that, that you could have problems there. And it is going to be a short step from there for, you know, the FTC equivalent here in the UK or other countries, and that to start doing the same thing. Now, they're going to tend to go after bigger brands first. Whether or not you're associated with a bigger brand, I can't say. Um, and that, but the do not, do not, do not, do not, do not ship in production code that has a totally brain-dead trust manager where you say, yep, if it's a certificate, it must be good. Um, and that because nobody out there would do anything that would be otherwise. Wow. Uh, is there any like minimum level recommended? Like 128 out of 360 be uh, encryption level or something like that? Uh, bigger is better. Um, uh, and that the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, from an Android standpoint, that would be no different than really your web server recommendations. Uh, and that, and so whatever the current recommended model would be for you know serving up to a web browser would be fine for Android. Um, and that the. Uh, I mean, I don't have all of the numbers memorized, and that I go and look them up when I need to generate a search. Um, and that, but the if, if it's good for the web, it should be fine for your cases. And in some cases, there's things that you can do that's better. To try to help make managing this stuff in Android apps a bit easier, I've been adding some code to my Quack Security Library. I mean, I actually didn't do an introduction earlier on in that, the, uh, but in case you don't know me, I, and that I wrote the Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development, the first, oldest, and most up-to-date book on Android development. Uh, I've also answered you know, 12,000 or so Stack Overflow questions, and I've published a number of, of the Commons Where Android components, and that's the Quack libraries. Quack security is one that is, not surprisingly, focused on security-related issues. One of the things I've added in there is a trust manager builder, a fluent interface for you to be able to create custom trust managers to handle certain scenarios that uh, are reasonably common yet clunky to set up necessarily on your own in Java so that you can then turn around and use those custom trust managers with you know, HTTPS URL connection, OK HTTP, HTTP client if you're still using it, um, those sorts of things to be able to configure your SSL better. So you wind up with code a little bit like this. I can set up a trust manager builder that says, oh, you can, what I want to do is I want to check for a self-signed certificate. I've loaded in as a raw resource a certificate I want to compare against. Here is the passcode for that uh, certificate uh, store, um, and that the here hard-coded, because usually these aren't going to come from a user, uh, and that if they are, I accept a, ch a char array rather than a string, so you've got an easier time of wiping out that password from memory if you want. So if, it, if we will accept either this self-signed certificate or anything that the default trust managers will do. And so the standard Android behavior uh, and that all of the root CAs and that, that it supports will take care of that too. So that way I can maybe use this set of custom trust managers and so forth and that for a variety of operations, not only talking to my own back-end web service that I'm using a self-signed certificate for, but also maybe my production app. And then, and then you turn around and you create an SSL context, open up your connection, whether it's HTTPS URL connection, OK, HTTP, or whatever, and then you tell that context, hey, please use this array of trust managers that that builder is building, and it use that SSL socket factory that we get from this context for this connection, and then that connection is going to use these rules for determining whether or not the SSL is valid or not. Yeah, I've got other uh, options in here in that if you want to specifically accept a particular private uh, certificate authority, there's hooks in there for that, and I'm going to be adding other stuff over time. And then, and so, make, so just because 
you know, you're trying to use some self-signed certificate, you don't have to go in and implement the, uh, the, the blind do, you know, accept all, uh, you know, trust manager, and that the, there are ways, whether you do it yourself, use a library like this, that you can teach Android relatively easily, hey, feel free to use this self-signed certificate, and then it will validate against your test servers, staging servers, or as we'll talk about in a little bit, even possibly your production servers that are using a self-signed certificate. What we're really worried about with the certificate validation are the so-called man-in-the-middle attacks and that. Uh, though you're welcome to substitute other values for that first M and that if you don't want to be considered sexist. Uh, and that if you are you know, worried about being considered speciesist and Martian in the middle might be a concern, you know, feel free to go with Murphy in the middle um, and that I'll take the blame. And we're worried about somebody being able to sniff on these connections because they spoofed the certificates that they have you know, intercepted things at the Wi-Fi access point or somewhere else along the chain between client and server where they've got a proxy that goes in there. We wind up talking to the proxy. The proxy sends us certificates back that claim to be you know, for this particular connection even though they're fraudulent and that if we blindly accept those certificates, well then we're going to you know, have decrypted data at that proxy and that proxy, therefore, could be doing stuff with that data that our users would prefer that they don't do. One particular flavor of this problem comes with the hacked certificate authority. Certificate authorities, you would think, would have buku security for making sure that nobody can go in and create fake uh, certificates uh, and that, that uh, claim to be processed by that certificate authority. Komodo, DigiNotar, Turk Trust, and others have demonstrated amply that certificate authorities and that have the same security problems that everybody else does. And there have been cases where you know there have been fake Google certificates that have been floating around the internet saying that yes, I am claiming to be doing an SSL connection for something at Google.com, where it's not an actual certificate that Google created, that it was forged based upon a hacked certificate authority. One solution for dealing with this is to do what you would never think of doing in ordinary web development, which is to use a self-signed certificate. Self-signed certificates and that have you know, a, a negative reputation in the web because web browsers you know, don't like them, uh, and with good reason. But the whole point behind the certificate authority is really to be handling scenarios like web browsers and web servers, where we have in web browser manufacturers and in websites. We don't know up front what websites a given web browser is going to talk to, and therefore the certificate authority mechanism is some way of validating that, yeah, okay, you know, this is all you know, fine, and that is a reasonable solution. But if you've got an Android app that is talking to your web service, that's one-to-one. -one. We don't need to worry about a certificate authority. Just use a self-signed certificate. And that the, particularly if that web service is solely in support of a mobile app, maybe beyond Android, if you're you know, doing your iOS and whatnot and that with it as well, um, and that but where you don't need web browsers hitting that particular web service, use a self-signed certificate. You can then validate on the client, is it this actual exact certificate? And it doesn't matter whether there's a hacked CA floating around, you're not using the certificate authorities in the first place. But sometimes that's not going to fly, particularly in the case where you know, that same server is also handling web requests, and that whether it be a traditional website, web services to be consumed by Ajax code on, on the web app, things along those lines, self-signed certificates are going to work well there. There are other things that you can do, though. Certificate pinning basically says, okay, well, if we can't confirm an individual certificate, can we at least validate that it's from a certificate authority that we're supposed to be working with? You know, we buy our certificates always from VeriSign. If somebody else is trying to communicate with our app and its SSL certificates are from some other certificate authority, clearly that ain't us. And therefore that particular certificate must be fraudulent. Moxie Marlin spike. Uh, nom de plume of a uh, popular security researcher uh, has 
the Android pinging project. This is a custom trust manager that uh, implements this sort of a pinning mechanism. It uses the same pin structure as is used by Google Chrome. Chrome pins very popular domains, such as Google.com, the big one at random. And that, that browser knows rules about all the Google.com SSL certificates. It knows that there are these four CAs that Google uses. If it sees certificates from any other certificate authority, it must be bad. And the, there is, and so there is a particular structure, a particular hash of the uh, subject public key info, um, and that that uh, Chrome uses. Moxie's code uses that same structure for being able to implement pinning in a custom trust manager in Android. The downside of this code is it's GPL v3 licensed and that which may cause problems for you in various application settings due to license concerns uh, and that the I'm going to try to convince him to relicense it um, uh, and that and I may want to write on my own if I can't um, and that uh, while trying very very hard not to get into any infringement issues um, and that because we could really use a pinning solution in that but and I can understand philosophically why you may want GPL v3 in that, but I mean, yeah, it's going to present problems for a lot of organizations, and that, and therefore, is uh, something to watch out for. Another thing that you can do to help deal with man in the middle attacks is certificate memorization. Maybe you don't know what the certificate authority necessarily is going to be. You can't strictly pin to that. You don't trust that, you know, purchasing might decide to buy from some other CA because they've got $10 off uh, and that or something along those lines. But what you do know is that when you're changing your certificates, you know that you rotate your certificates on an annual basis and it's going to happen every April 2nd or whatever. Um, Certificate memorization basically says, all right, let's go with a trust on first use model. We'll assume, since statistically speaking, it's unlikely that somebody's going to be hacked, we're going to assume that the certificate that they first see is valid. But then we're going to yelp if we see a different certificate. And, then, and so, you know, two months from now, all of a sudden we do a connection, we get a different certificate than what the user originally did, We've got no indication anywhere that we actually changed our certificate. The app and that can then tell the user, hey, um, we're seeing something different. Is this something that you are expecting? Um, and therefore is, you know, I mean, you were told by IT, yes, you're going to get this pop-up dialogue and that warning you about this stuff, you know, just say okay. Or if you're unaware of anything like that, you may be, the victim of a man in the middle attack, uh, and that please can, uh, you may want to discontinue your use of the application. There is a memorizing trust manager implementation available out on the interwebs as well. This one MIT license, so license issues aren't there. I'm not a big fan of the implementation uh, and that uh, under the covers, um, and that it makes does some kind of squirrely Android things. The security is probably fine, uh, and that from an Android standpoint, uh, it does stuff that I'm not real happy with. And so this is another thing that I will probably be re-implementing here, uh, and that I'd be including in my Quack security library a, memor a memorization solution, uh, and that that is um, uh, a bit more gives you more control uh, and that they assume that they can handle all the UI for validating that certificate, which I know won't fly because the graphic designers are going to want to get involved. Uh, and that, and so having a sample Im implementation with the hooks for you to be able to provide your own UI for that stuff is going to be important for adoption. By the way, all my Quack libraries are Apache 2 licensed uh, and that the, so long as you don't sue me for patent infringement, you can do anything you want with that code. I really wanted to do uh, what part of encrypting all the things you do not understand, but that was getting the font a little small in the image. Uh, and that the beyond encrypting data in motion, you also need to think a little bit about encrypting the data at rest. Um, and that because 
Android devices, if they fall into the hands of the forces of evil, you know, the forces of evil are going to be able to get at storage, even internal storage. We think of internal storage as being private to our app, but then, you know, pretty much every device out there, there's some recipe for rooting it, if not permanently, at least on a temporary basis. And all the forces of evil need is temporary access, uh, and that in order to be able to slurp down the data. They don't care about surviving a reboot, so long as they can keep the phone juiced up, uh, and that, and they've got root access, and, you know, they can, you know, do their work as, you know, whatever time they need. Um, there's a couple of ways of approaching the problem. One is to worry about the encryption yourself. Once again, this is a case where doing the right thing is sometimes complicated. There are, you know, uh, in a crypto lint, a lot of the things that it's checking for are things like, you know, uh, insufficient key, der key derivation iterations and stuff like that, which to a lot of developers is, what the heck is a key derivation? Uh, and, that, and how many iterations do I need and so forth? Uh, and, that, and so ideally, you try to aim for libraries that do the right thing out of the box, but then maybe customizable beyond that if you have particular requirements. You know, your IT department has got a bee in its bonnet about particular encryption algorithms and therefore wants to go and have you use something other than the defaults. My go-to solution for internal, I mean, for, for internal storage encrypting that, if it's a database, is SQL Cipher for Android. This is a near drop-in replacement for SQLite. You download a zip file, unpack some jars, Linux SOs, and an asset, put those into your project, change your import statements from being android.database and android.database.sqlite to their SQL Cypher for Android equivalents, Supply the passphrase in your get readable and get writable database calls on your SQLite open helper or the equivalent sorts of static methods on the SQLite database class and you're done. Everything else is identical. It's all the same query, raw query, insert, update, delete, exec SQL um, stuff that you've been doing. You get the same cursors back that you've been doing and you can pop them into your cursor adapters or whatever it is you want to do with them. Um, and that and it transparently is going to provide a ES-256 encryption on the fly, um, and that of all your contents, including your table schemas, you know, all the metadata and whatnot. The downside is it does add some bulk, uh, and that the way they implement this is that they ship a complete copy of SQLite that's got the SQL Cipher extensions baked into it. Um, they've got no way of really grafting that into the firmware copy on the device. And because OpenSSL has changed over the years and there's been bug fixes that they haven't made it out to all Android devices because not every manufacturer updates their devices. Um, they ship their own copy of OpenSSL um, and that and so the, it's going to add several megabytes to your application size. Um, and that the some circumstances, that's going to be a huge barrier to adoption, particularly if you are already hitting up against limits like, say, the 50 megabyte play store limit. In other circumstances, you know, a few megs here, a few megs there, big deal. How do you protect the password? Ah, I, uh, well, that kind of depends on what you're trying to do. The, in the ideal circumstance, you don't do what I'm going to show you. And the, I've got a sample app in my book that, let's see here, it is in my provider, um, and that where I am working with <coughs> SQL Cipher. And so my imports are for net.sqlcipher.database.sqlite database and net.sqlcipher.database.sqlite query builder. Again, their APIs are the same other than when you're opening up the database you got to provide a passphrase, which in my case, actually this is not as bad as it, as it could be, uh, at least it looks better, um, and that I am having this passed into my content provider via the call mechanism. Call's a little known corner of the content provider API, added an API level 11. It basically allows you to do kind of almost bound service style remote procedure calls with a content provider. You basically provide a method name and a bundle of data that then comes into the call method and it's up to it to look at that method and say, oh, well, you wanted to perform this operation. 
uh, here's the data to work with, and here's a bundle of return values. Uh, and that not necessarily having to do anything with a particular database operation, useful for configuration purposes. And in my case, I am using call in order to say, hey, here's the passphrase that should be used when I'm working with this content provider. In theory, that should come from the user. That should, I should be popping up a dialogue, having a fragment, uh, whatever, in that where I'm collecting the passphrase from the user. This particular sample, um, I, yeah, I am, uh, well, I'm kind of hard coding it. Um, and that thing which is not good. Um, and that the, uh, just because we do things in a book example does not necessarily mean it's the best thing in the world. Um, and that the, and if you actually get the book rather than just downloading the source code to the samples and that you'll actually see paragraphs explaining, yeah, don't do this, we're doing this for simplicity. Here's another example later on that does a better job. Um, and that the, uh, ideally the passwords are coming from the user. These passwords though are going to go through I think in the current version of SQL Cipher, it's 64,000 iterations of PBKTF2. Uh, and that the, in other words, that value secret is going to be hashed 64,000 times. Uh, and, that, and it's that resulting hashed value that is actually the key for the encryption that's being used in the database. And that's to help defend against dictionary attacks. That either, if they're going to do a dictionary attack, they've got to go through the 64,000 iterations for every time they're trying it, and that adds enough overhead that users aren't going to really notice, but is going to really slow down the ability of uh, somebody to crack that password. Or, if they want to bypass that, now we've got a key space that's a mile long, um, and that because it's this hashed value that's, you know, something on the order of, you know, 64 hex digits, um, and that the, you know, uh, that's going to, you know, massively inflate the number of things that they're going to have to try. And so it's trying to help save on the brute force attacks. Um, there is a related project, um, IO Cypher, that uh, offers a virtual file system that's using SQL Cipher under the covers as the backing store. Rather than actually storing files on the file system, it is storing blobs in a column in a SQL Cipher table. And so therefore you get all of the same encryption capabilities of SQL Cipher. You can even you know, share the passphrase and that's because you're, you can share the SQL Cipher instance. Um, and, that, and just as we replace SQLite database and SQLite open helper with equivalents, in this case you replace file with an I.O. Cypher equivalent, and you work with its implementation of file, which is going to turn around and do the actual SQL I.O. with all of the encryption and decryption along the way. And so this gives you the feel of the file, working with the input streams and output streams and so forth, and that yet the results are all encrypted. And once again, with sensible defaults for encryption algorithm, key derivation, initialization vectors, and all that icky crypto <laughs> stuff, that if you were going straight to, you know, Java X Crypto or Bouncy Castle or something like that, you've got to decide all that stuff yourself, and too many developers make the wrong decision. Um, as I mentioned, do not hard code passwords, even if book examples do so. Um, and that the WhatsApp uh, was, you know, disclosed within the past month or so, and that hard coded the passwords for their encrypted data. Um, and therefore, you, know, you could actually get that password through fairly simple reverse engineering, and as a result, you know, you wound up where all that stuff could get decrypted. There's another possibility of rather than hard coding the passphrase is to say, we're going to save the passphrase on internal storage. That, too, offers limited security. If they can root the device, they can get at that file. Facebook released the Facebook Conceal open source library within the past couple of months. Uh, and that it got a lot of pub, and that the uh, Facebook trying to help security on Android. And it does to a very limited extent. The net effect is that what they're using it for is for external storage. And that the stuff that users and the other apps can get to, they're encrypting it on the fly much like how SQL Cypher encrypts on the fly with sensible defaults, with, but storing the encryption key that they generate and then on internal storage. So the net effect is that external storage winds up having the same security characteristics as internal storage. 
um, and that it would be easier for somebody to brute the device and get at internal storage than it would be for them to brute force the external storage um, encrypted files. But that still limits you to the security of internal storage, which may or may not be deemed adequate for your application. Um, Android allowed backup flag that you can have on your application element in your manifest. If that's set to true, then anybody can download your app's data. And then if they have the Android SDK and sophisticated data transfer tools, such as a USB cable, um, and that they, they just run a command and boom, they're going to get a backup of that data and that backup uh, and that can easily be picked apart and get at your data. If your data is encrypted, SQL Cipher or whatever, and that, that's less of an issue. But if you are simply relying on internal storage um, and that bear in mind that if you're allowing these backups that that's a significant hole in your security defenses. Uh, and that you may be better served implementing your own online backup regimen. Um, and that, frankly, I don't care for backup manager that much. I've got a blog post from 2010, 2011, whenever they released it, uh, and that unsafe at any speed, pointing out that there's absolutely no guarantees anywhere with the backup manager system of where that data is going. Uh, and that, I mean, they specifically disavow in all of their literature saying where the data goes. It does not have to go to Google, uh, and that it could be uh, backed up at a carrier, um, and that it could be backed up by people who you don't care for. And of course, don't create world-readable files. There's reasons why that stuff's not deprecated, uh, and that don't be using mode world-readable, mode world-writable, and that is you're creating files on internal storage. Surprisingly enough, world-readable files are world-readable. Um, and that anybody can go get to those files. Um, and that if you want to make data on internal storage available to third parties on a selective basis, use File Provider. It's available in the Android support package as of last summer. And that it's a drop-in content provider. No Java coding required. All you do is plug it into your manifest, give it you know, your authority string and whatnot, have a little bit of XML metadata to say, okay, Kind of like how you configure a web server. If you see a URI that looks like this, that's referring to this location on internal storage. And then file provider actually will serve up the files for you. And that way, you've got you know, Android permission mechanisms and whatnot in that for helping to limit who's going to be able to get at that stuff as opposed to it being a world. Well, yep. For this uh, data encryption will work if I'm expose some data to the services. Contacts, for example. Ah, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, it's going to be unencrypted at that point in all likelihood. And I mean, there's nothing stopping you, I suppose, from using one of those random extra values on contacts contract and that for storing some encrypted bit. Um, and that, but that's not the norm. And that usually you're putting stuff in that is supposed to be publicly visible. And therefore, it will be unencrypted and it will be publicly visible. Um, and that we'll get into some of those sorts of issues and that, uh, you know, as if, if you do like to expose data from your application and that um, do so consciously uh, and that the, uh, we'll talk about some uh, unconscious uh, or maybe semi-conscious ones um, and that coming up here in a bit. So in theory, I should have two set of data. One is publicly available data and one is personal kind of data basically. I, I, mean, the, I mean, if that makes sense for your app, yes. And that the, you can use, I, I forget. I haven't dealt with contact contract in a while now, but there's the way of getting the somewhat durable identifier of the contact and that use that as the key for your own database and that additional data and that if you want to associate with that contact, but you want to control it, you want to uh, keep it away from contacts contract because anybody with the read contacts permission can get at anything that's in contacts contract. Another approach to the encryption is to say, yeah, all right, I don't feel like dealing with all that stuff. We're just going to make sure that the user has done full disk encryption on their device. Um, and then, you know, full disk encryption has been around for a while and is actually not that bad nowadays, other than that teeny means a little problem that Google still insists that the password for the uh, full disk encryption has to be the same password that you use for getting past your lock screen. People get past their lock screen all the time, and so therefore they tend to choose relatively short pins, which means that you know that full disk encryption can be brute forced. Um, that being said, you know it's 
that enforcing full disk encryption is better than nothing. Um, and that the um, and of course you know we're, it's that is also you know of course going to be subject to your five dollar wrench attacks um, and that you can't have a security presentation in the modern era and that without having an XKCD slide of at least one um, and that the um, and that and I actually have not done the uh, conversion rate I forget exactly how much five pounds is I mean, I mean five dollars is a pound. Um, and that, but the, it is possible for you to go in and say, okay, I want to use the device administration APIs to say, yeah, I want you to do full disk encryption. Now, I, uh, what I'm going to show is a little bit of device admin stuff uh, for password quality, and that the, it's a short jump from there to be able to go in and um, uh, set things up to require full disk encryption. You wind up having a device admin receiver. That's a base class that you'll inherit from that you will use for handling various events. You'll put that inside your manifest somewhere where that is defended by a system permission, bind device admin. Only the firmware can hold that permission. And so only the firmware is going to be able to talk to this particular broadcast receiver. We'll talk more about that concept in a bit. Where I, in particular, am looking to find out, hey, when are passwords changed, and when are passwords successful or failure? And uh, in particular, I want to log password failures, and that uh, because I may want to do that as well as enforcing full disk encryption, so that I've got some idea that somebody maybe has taken. Last year, there was a, a project uh, where they took an Arduino kit. Uh, and that hooked it up to a robot with a capacitive stylus who basically would brute force at the lock screen level an Android device. It had a camera that basically was looking for detection, okay, did we get past the lock screen? And I think they uh, used a Raspberry Pi, uh, and that has the brains behind the operation. Um, and that is so this little robot would try all sorts of different pin combinations until they came up with the one that worked. Um, you know, that of course will result in a lot of password failures and that you could, with the device admin ABIs, you can find out about those and take appropriate steps. You know, if they failed 10 times, we're going to alert IT security. If they failed 20 times, we're going to remote wipe the device. Um, stuff along those lines. You wind up also needing a little bit of metadata specifically to tell Android, okay, what capabilities of the device admin API am I looking to use? This particular app is looking to control the password quality. You know, okay, uh, we need you to have, you know, a minimum of 10 characters and at least two of them have to be, uh, you know, numbers. Um, and, that, and we're going to watch for login failures. There is also storage encryption as an available option to say I want to be able to require that the device has full disk encryption. Device admin APIs is something that the user has to opt into. And that and so the you can get a device policy manager, it's one of those ever so fun system services. Uh, and then and ask them, ask the manager, hey, am I a device admin? Am I active as an administrator? Where you pass in a component name that points to that device admin receiver implementation that you have in the manifest. This simply returns true or false of whether or not the user has agreed to have your app be a device administrator. If it's false, you're going to be able to go in and fire up an activity to prompt the user, hey, could you please make me a device admin? And maybe your app refuses to run until they do so. If you are a device admin, well, then you're going to be able to go in and, you know, determine whether or not the active password, you know, meets, you know, your requirements and so forth. <clears throat> Where you can set those requirements up via methods like set password quality and then in your device admin receiver. Similarly, there is methods where you can require full disk encryption to be on. What you can't do is force the full disk encryption to happen immediately. Because it may not be an appropriate time for the user to spend the hour or whatever it's going to take to run through the full disk crypto process. In particular, you really want to be plugged into in the mains at that point in time, and therefore, uh, you know, they may not be in position to 
do that. So you can ask that it be full disk encrypted, you can find out if it's full disk encrypted, uh, and that you cannot force it to be full disk encrypted, um, and that immediately, because that is a very lengthy operation. But you can use these sorts of things in order to help make sure that the environment in which your app is running is secure enough using a framework, platform level security. You gotta watch out for the things where you are exposing data that you were thinking that you were exposing data. One big thing comes with exporting your components. An exported component, or by component I mean activity service, broadcast receiver, or content provider, if it is exported, third party apps can talk to it. The rules, <coughs> activity services and manifest registered broadcast receivers are exported if you have an intent filter. If you do not have an intent filter, they are not exported by default. Though there are ways with the Android exported flag in the manifest that you can override that behavior. If you are registering a broadcast receiver through the register receiver method, it is always exported because you're always providing an intent filter with those. Those cannot be used with explicit intents. The how is apps being implicit intent? Content providers up through Android 4.1 were exported by default. This was dumb. I have no idea who thought that was a good idea. I, you know, there's a million apps out on the Play Store, and that uh, I got 20 quid that says that there are at least 10,000 apps out there where the developer, you know, you know, wrote it a couple of years ago before Link started warning you, hey, your content provider's exported. Are you sure about that? Um, and that where they thought that content provider was just purely for internal use. And their data is flapping in the breeze because they have no protection on that content provider at all. Anybody can go in and read and write that data. Dumb! Now, Lint has been kvetching about this for a while. And so apps that have been maintained, if the developer is paying uh, at least a little bit of attention, and then they'll hopefully have locked that down. And as of Android 4.2, the default of a content provider is that it's not exported. Which is why you really, 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 really want to have the Android exported flag on your content providers to explicitly say what you're looking for because if you accept the default, it's going to vary depending upon what version of Android you're running on. Exception being if you're only supporting Android 4.2 and higher and that you can you know, perhaps get away with you know, assuming that it's not exported by default. The net effect. Only use an intent filter if you're really trying to talk to third-party apps. Don't have an intent filter for purely internal purposes. We see this a lot out on like Stack Overflow, and then, you know, they show their manifest, and they've got you know these intent filters, and that with custom action strings, and it's pretty obvious from the circumstances that you know they're not really expecting third parties to talk to those activities and such but they're just kind of blindly copying things around. They saw the intent filter for the main launcher you know, combination, and that's for the home screen launcher, and assumes you needed to have an intent filter everywhere. So your launcher activity, yeah, it needs an intent filter, because we're expecting third parties, like the home screen, to talk to it, to start that activity. But don't say that every one of your activities has an intent filter. Specifically, don't go in and say all my activities have an intent filter, but I'm going to have them be not exported. Uh, there's what I would consider a bug, and what uh, Diana Warren considers to be just the state of the world, um, and that where things like the the chooser, uh, when you get the chooser window, when you start up an implicit intent for an activity, and there's multiple possible matches, um, and that the that doesn't actually filter upon whether or not the user can actually do any of the things that's in there. And so if you've got an activity, let's say, for example, your United Parcel Service, UPS, uh, and the package delivery service, and you maybe, for example, published an app that you know, allows people to be able to work with UPS, and maybe that app you ripped code out of barcode scanner and incorporated it into your app so that you could scan barcodes without depending upon the zebra crossing barcode scanner app. And you just blindly copy the manifest entries, and so you're advertising that, oh yes, we support you know com.zxzing.intent.action.scan. Oh, but we don't want to do that, so we're going to mark it as not exported. Well now, 
if somebody you know launches an intent, uh, starts an activity with that action, say another app is really using intent integrator to talk to barcode scanner, now they get two choices: barcode scanner and the UPS app. They tap on the UPS app and boom, crashes with a security exception. And then, so if you're going to have an intent filter, please have the component be exported because you're trying to talk to third parties. It is purely internal. Ditch the intent filter. Just use explicit intents. Just bear in mind, nothing's stopping you from attaching an action to an explicit intent. Uh, and that the I mean, so if you've got code in your app that is looking at action strings and is you know, branching based upon that, you can still do that without the intent filter. So long as when you're creating those intents, you just stick the class of the component name inside the constructor. You know, again, pay attention to your content providers, and then if you do export it, please secure it with permissions. We'll talk about that in a moment. Register receiver. Try to minimize your use of this for purely internal communications within your app. Uh, and that use an event bus, local broadcast manager, Squares Auto, Green Robots event bus, something along those lines. Those are purely within your process. They don't leave. Um, and that register receiver is open to the world. Uh, there's ways you can secure it with permissions, but it is exported by default. Um, and, that, and so now you're in circumstances where third parties could craft a broadcast that they send that you wind up picking up that maybe is spoofing data, maybe is trying to crash your app, things along those lines. And be aware of all those other control channels that you are setting up to allow your app to be controlled from outside. You rigged up the stuff where you're watching incoming SMS messages and that for like a password reset mechanism. Guess what? Anybody can send an SMS message. Um, and that, how do you know that those SMS messages are triggered by, say, your website through some SMS um, gateway and that versus somebody else who's trying to break into a user's app or, you know, otherwise mess up, you know, the functionality of that app, you know, denial of service sort of thing. They reset some user's password um, and that does something they don't know. If you have a server socket um, and that you're really open. At minimum, you're open to anything on the device if you're listening to localhost, and heaven forbid if you're listening to you know the radio IP address of the device on Wi-Fi or whatever. Now you're open to other things that can find out that IP address and talk to you, even if that IP address you know is behind Mac or whatever. And that there's still going to be more devices than that that are going to be able to talk to you, and many of those things aren't what you want to talk. Um, and so on, and that the you know make sure that you understand what is going on. You know, GCM while spoofing is less of an issue. Bear in mind that while Google encrypts that data in motion between the, your server and Google, and between Google and the device, Google's got this data. And you know, even if you trust Google, uh, Google has. Uh, well, let's just say the NSA uh, and that has uh, apparently done some interesting things with Google, um, and that and so the uh, you may want to consider do we need to encrypt uh, and that those GCM messages and to at least uh, reduce the odds and that of somebody you know peering at that 4K worth of data or do we need to you know make sure that that data doesn't contain anything directly of value? It's simply like a URL or something to trigger a poll. Uh, where we've got our own security for handling the balance. If you are retrieving data that is protected by system permissions and you in turn are publishing that data through your own API, please turn around and secure your APIs with permissions themselves. Otherwise, you're going to wind up leaking data. You go get contact information, you make some of that contact information available through, say, a bound service or your own content provider or something like that. Somebody figures that out, now they can go get that contact information by talking to your app, even though they don't have read contacts. They don't have access to maybe everything of the contacts data, but they'll have access to whatever you're publishing. You should be defending your API, either with your own custom permission or if nothing else with the same read contacts permission. So that way, you know, that third party app who's talking to you 
has to, the user has got to know that, hey, that particular app uh, is trying to access this data, and so they are aware of what's going on. Your activities, services, broadcast receivers, you can have the Android permission attribute on them, automatically defends those components with that permission. Content providers, you also have read and write permission and separate things who are controlling read and write operations, similar to contacts, where they basically have a read permission of read contacts and a write permission of write contacts. If you've got scenarios that are more complicated than that, you can always drop down to use methods like check calling permission, you know, methods on package manager and so forth in order to be able to determine, you know, is my caller, does it have, you know, certain permission? Does this package over here that is looking to talk to me, does it hold a permission to introspect this, these sorts of permissions at runtime to see who holds what? You can take that another step further and invent your own permissions. You can have permission elements in your manifest and that where you give the permission in name, please don't use the Android permission prefix on it, uh, and that you want to make sure that your permissions aren't going to collide with anyone else, let alone ones that Google comes up with in the future. Namespace it for your own project, please. Uh, you know, reverse domain name, you know, same sort of thing you would use for your packages. You provide a label and a description, which is going to control what the user sees at install time, um, and that you, in, in the, along with any other permissions, that the third party is asking for, they're going to see your label and your permission. So make these string resources, translate them for everything that your app is translated to, and remember that you're talking to users here. Uh, speak human, uh, and that don't speak geek, um, and that they may not understand geek. Um, and, that the, and you can specify the protection level, where the three that we SDK developers will typically work with, normal and dangerous, any third party app can request to hold those with the corresponding uses permission element. The only difference between those is where they appear in the sort order. Um, and that dangerous ones will tend to appear higher in the list of requested permissions. In particular, in cases where some of those permissions, you know, there's like a see more sort of fold out area, dangerous ones are always above the fold. Signature says that only an app that is signed with your signing key can hold this custom permission, in theory. Um, and, that, and so therefore, you know, that's designed for cases where say you've got a family of apps, uh, and, that, and you want them to be able to interoperate, but you're not necessarily trying to open up these APIs to arbitrary third parties. You're gonna have all your apps signed by the same signing key. They'll be able to talk to each other because they'll be able to hold the custom permission and therefore talk to components defended with that permission even though they're not going to, I mean, third parties aren't going to be able to hold it, in theory. The problem is that this doesn't work. Um, specifically, per permissions are first one in wins. Anybody can define a permission with any name. And uh, as a result, if somebody else gets into the device before your app does and defines your permission, a, they can define it however they want. They can change the protection level, they can change the labels uh, and that to make it seem more benign than maybe it really is. And they can hold it without the user knowing about it. If you define a permission, you can hold that permission without the user being prompted about that permission. And so therefore, they can hold a permission of yours even though the user should have been informed about it simply because they were installed first. This sucks. Um, so, walk through some quick scenarios. Uh, and now we've got three applications. App A is your app. You've defined a custom permission, you're defending components with that permission. App B is an attacker. It wants to be able to talk to App A, talk to those secured uh, components without the user knowing about it, and bypassing any signature level restrictions. Whereas App C is maybe a more ordinary third-party app, uh, and that maybe you're publishing details about your permission because this is actually part of an API and SDK that you're exposing, and that app C is a more legitimate user of that API. In the normal case, your app is installed first, and then, say, app C gets installed. At that point in time, 
when AppC is installed, it will see the user's permission element, the user will be prompted, hey, AppC wants to be able to do X, Y, Z, and the user can say yep or nope, as the user sees fit. But if C is installed first, the user isn't told about this custom permission that was requested, because it's at the time of C being installed, that permission wasn't defined yet. The user's permission said, I'm looking for a permission named foo, Android looks around and says, I don't know what foo is. I don't have a label or a description for it. So the user isn't prompted about it, because there's nothing to prompt them with, but C doesn't actually hold the permission. And so when C tries talking to app A, C fails, with a security exception. In some cases, this isn't a big problem. In a case where app A would almost assuredly be installed before app C, this isn't a big deal. So if this is a host and plugin scenario, the host app is almost always installed before the plugin. Uh, and then if somebody installs the plugin first and therefore has to you know, uninstall that, install the host app, and then reinstall the plugin, you know, it's not the end of the world. But if these apps are more peers, Facebook wants to talk to Twitter, or Twitter wants to talk to Facebook, they could be installed in either order. And that there is no assumed cardinality there, assuming you don't work for Facebook or Twitter. Um, and therefore, the, um, you know, it, it, maybe those are protected by custom permissions and that the, you run into a problem. But you could say then, okay, well, what we have is that we'll have third parties actually define the permission themselves. We'll have a third party app also have the permission element. That view basically is what app B is doing. App B is going to define the same permission that app A does. If app A is installed first, like's good. App B is going to behave just like app C did. The user will be prompted about this custom permission and the user can make a theoretically informed decision. But if app B is installed first, because app B also defined this custom permission, app B gets that permission without the user being prompted. And app B can define that permission however they want. And so your app wants it to be a signature level permission, they define it to be normal. And so even though they're not signed with the same signing key as your app, they'll be able to talk to your component. The good news is, because installation order is key here, it is relatively unlikely that this is going to be a problem for a bulk attack. Malware could certainly be uploaded to the Play Store that exploits this, but you know, it's a 50 50 shot you know, of whether or not they're going to be installed first. And then if enough installs of this malware app that claims to have this permission and users decline installing it, maybe somewhere along the line somebody's going to realize that something's going on here. But if the app B, the attacker, is in a situation where it's known that it can be pre installed first, now we have more of an issue. Devices being handed from employers to employees. Buy a used device off of eBay or Craigslist. The gift bags they give out at the Oscars. Uh, and that you gotta have a smartphone in those nowadays. Um, and then any of those sorts of scenarios, and that the, you know, there could be preloads on them. It could even be that it's preloaded with a ROM mod that you, make, you, know, you buy a device off of eBay specifically because they've installed CyanogenMod on it because you don't want to go through all the headache of installing CyanogenMod, you don't know whether or not that is CyanogenMod. It could be a mod of CyanogenMod that has app bees in there where they're going to go in and they claim to hold Facebook and whatever permission. I've got some help for this as well. In that crack security library, I have permission utils with the check custom permissions method. You just call this method, you supply uh, your uh, context, and then I will turn around and I'm going to scan first your app to figure out what custom permissions you define. And then I'm going to scan all the other apps in the system to see if they also define those same permissions. The idea is that you call this on first run of your app. And, then, and so I will go through and I'll quick check to see whether or not anyone else has already defined one of your permissions give you back the details. So, okay, well this permission is being held by this application, um, and that, and in particular, I'll also tell you whether or not there's changes. Did they change the protection level? Did they change the label or the description? 
Because it may be there are cases where you do want third parties to actually define your permissions for you so that the installation order does not matter, but you are relying on the fact that that permission is defined the same way that you would have defined it, uh, and that I will help you determine that. And so you can use this check custom permissions in order to be able to then make decisions. If, you're, if it comes back and there's nothing, then life is good. You were installed first, your definition of the permission holds, if somebody else is installed first uh, and that their permission is the one that's defining matters, you can know about it, alert the user, send it back through your analytics channels, refuse to run your app, whatever level of defense you believe is appropriate for that circumstance. Can my app uh, override, uh, like say for example, if the first couple of applications B has uh, a normal permission label? Can I override to say it's more secure with signature or something like that? Nope. Again, first one in wings. It would be, right. uh, and that the uh, the problem with that scenario would be denial of service. Uh, now an app B who would be installed afterwards could upgrade the security to signature level, and now all the stuff we are expecting to be able to talk with that uh, permission won't be able to talk if they're not having to be signed by the same signing key. And so ordinary SDK sorts of stuff where you're providing an SDK for third parties, now all of a sudden those break, so the host can't talk to its plugins and things like that anymore. And so that doesn't, that, that doesn't work either. It's first one in wins, period. Um, and, but you can detect, you know, if somebody was installed before you and they defined it as normal, you defined it as signature, this will tell you that that has occurred. <coughs> And you can take steps. What you can't do is basically somehow convince Android, no, 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 please change the definition of this permission to be signed. Is there anything like on the fly and create my own uh, separate um, names or something like that? No. No. Uh, and that the um, and that the it's got to be baked into your manifest. Um, and that the um, and then and so you know in terms of what you're publishing and that you know it's got to be a fixed value. Um, and that for you and for all the apps who are trying to work collectively with this permission. Sometimes you're going to want to have these permissions, but for not everything. You want to have pinholes in the permission firewall. For example, a content provider, if it is exported, exported says third parties can talk to this content provider whenever the third party wants to, and then it's up to your permissions to defend against them. Um, and then, even if it's not exported though, third parties can still talk to that content provider when you say they can. You can say, oh, okay, hey, I I've created this email client. I want to be able to view an attachment. It happens to be a PDF. Oh, my email client doesn't have a PDF library baked in. I want to launch the user's choice PDF viewer. But I don't want all apps on the system to be able to get at the user's email attachments all the time. I don't even want the PDF viewer to be able to get to an email attachment at arbitrary points in time. I want to say, right now, I want to start an activity to view this PDF, and you can view this PDF at this moment, and then your access is going to lapse after some period of time. To do that on your provider, and that you can have the grant URI permissions attribute. If this is missing, you're saying, I'm not trying to do per request customization of the security. It is what it is in terms of the exported flag and in terms of the permissions that I have on the component. If this is set to true, then your Java code is allowed to have any of your content that's published by this content provider be readable on a per request basis by including on the intent that you use, say, with start activity for the action view for the PDF file, including flag grant read URI permission and or flag grant write URI permission, which says for this particular request and nothing else, whoever's processing this request gets to hold my read or write permission for this content provider. And that, and that their ability to do so is gated by whatever URI is inside that intent. The, they can get to this one URI for this one operation for this particular capability, but nothing else. Grant URI permissions equal false says, yes, I want to have this capability. 
No, I don't want it to be for everything in the content provider. Instead, Android will look for a grant URI permission child element where you will list uh, a little bit along the lines of how you provide you know, URIs in your intent filter with the data uh, elements uh, and that to say, okay, these particular paths inside of my content provider, we can use that for these uh, for, for these slides, but other paths are, are not considered valid. So for example, I'm going to expose the email attachments, but I also have my content provider exposing the emails themselves. We'll allow flight grant read URI permission to work for the attachments, but not for the emails. You've got to hold the permission for those. And that way, you know, even if some future developer accidentally tries putting these flags on the intent, they won't take effect because they won't be matching one of the URI paths and that that you specified in the grant URI permissions element. And so this way, you can say, all right, I'm going to lock down my provider, yet still allow third-party access, even without user having to you know, agree to permissions or anything like that, uh, and that, but on a very selective basis, small pinholes in that file. Sanitize your inputs, um, and that you know we're used to thinking things of like on a web app, and that you know little Bobby table scenarios, and that where you know somebody types in SQL into one of our input forms, and that in hopes of you know modifying our data, crashing our backend, whatever. Uh, and that there are similar sorts of things you're going to want to consider, and that in your application, if you have exported components and you're accepting extras on those intents, make sure that the extras make sense. Google screwed this up. Uh, it was a vulnerability that was announced several months ago, uh, and that uh, even though the underlying uh, fix had come out a little bit before then, um, if you've implemented a preference activity recently, you'll know that you've got to override this is valid fragment method, uh, and that to say, hey, is this fragment supposed to be shown in this activity? On the surface, that looks totally goofy. It's like, oh, why are you asking me this? I'm the one who's setting up this activity. The problem is, is that preference activity accepts extras that allow outsiders, whoever is invoking that intent, to specifically say, I want to drive to a particular preference fragment, rather than maybe showing, say, the two-frame uh, you know, tablet layout uh, and that at its initial starting point, we want to specifically go to a particular preference fragment, so we'll activate that one in the list and we'll show that one on the right. And they didn't actually check to make sure that that was a fragment that was supposed to go into preferences. Uh, and, that, and so any fragment could be specified. And so therefore, you would have circumstances where an attacker would be able to cause an arbitrary fragment out of your application to appear to the user, uh, and that even though that, you know, it may be that that's not an, uh, an appropriate point in time. For example, maybe it's the sort of thing that that fragment is only going to be shown to logged in users, uh, and that, and you know, now they can arrange to show it when you're not logged in. And so there, they were inspecting, they were accepting an extra, they weren't sanitizing it to make sure that it was valid. They then added that into the API, leaving us to have to valid do the validation for them. Your, the URIs that you get in on the intents, you know, if there are certain characteristics that you're expecting that aren't going to be automatically handled by your intent filter and that you might want to examine those and bear in mind that you know there's you know the URI could actually be pointing to anything you know how defensive programming and how you would interpret those URIs in terms of you know the input streams you get back or whatever and that with the content resolver that you are not going to make mistakes with that data if they hand you something that claims to be a PNG but isn't content provider or other places where you're using SQL, yeah, SQL injection could be an issue. Less though of a problem for users, users aren't likely to be typing in little bobby tables into your GUI, and that's simply because it's only going to affect them. It's a bigger problem if you're accepting data from outside, RSS feeds uh, and that stuff like that. You know, could there be something that a craft, especially crafted RSS entry, and that you know the description happens to contain stuff that's going to effectively be a SQL injection attack against your application? If you're exposing a bound service via AIDL to third parties, you know, 
same stuff that you'd ordinarily do with an SDK and that check your input parameters, make sure that they're sensible. Think a little bit about your development tools. Um, Gradle is going to be a big thing here in 2014 and uh, that we're making the pivot from Eclipse and Ant to Android Studio and Gradle. And Google and Gradleware and whatnot say Gradle W is a great solution. You use Gradle W as your command to run your Gradle commands and it will bootstrap your environment. If you don't have Gradle installed or you have a different version of Gradle than the project expecting, we're going to go in and we're going to download this. Only use Gradle W if you are trusting implicitly that project and where it's getting its tools from. This is designed for enterprise circumstances or you know, work other teams in that where you've got a bunch of developers um, and that you're working with an internal repository, that sort of stuff. I don't publish Gradle W on any of my quack libraries, even though they're all great already. Uh, and that because you shouldn't be trusting me to be providing you with your copy of Gradle. You've got no idea where I may have tweaked the Gradle W configuration to pull stuff from and that I could have gone in there and be having you download some hacked version of Gradle W or I'm going to happily copy up to the internet all your source code uh, and then even for your own private in-house apps. Don't use Gradle W unless you trust it implicitly and I should not be trusted. Similar, you can write with similar sorts of things for your <coughs> build time dependencies um, and that effectively those are extensions to Gradle um, and that, yeah, we are hoping that, you know, nobody hacks Maven Central um, and that the, um, I'm waiting, uh, and that it seems inevitable. Um, and that, and so the, you know, we're, I mean, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, the more you are doing download tools on the fly from arbitrary stuff that you aren't doing the downloading yourself, you are trusting that those downloads are downloading what you think they're downloading and not downloading something else. Similarly, you need to think about sanitizing your outputs. Some things that we do in Android development implicitly provide data to third parties that we don't necessarily think about it that way. Anytime you're creating remote views, the whole point behind the remote views is to pass it across process boundaries for some third party process to render your UI, such as a home screen rendering your app widget. Well, that home screen can look at those views because it's their views once they, you know, render them onto their own UI so they can look at any of the data inside of there. Do not publish private information via a remote views. Do not publish private data in a notification. Notifications can be read by apps that, you know, implement the notification listener services and so forth. Clipboard. Any app can go in and read the clipboard. And so on the one hand, the password manager that puts the password automatically for you on the clipboard for easy copy and paste, oh, that's so slick. On the other hand, for that window of time, that password is available to anyone. And, you know, malware could look and say, hey, gee, hmm, KeyPass X is in, I mean, or rather, KeyPass Droid happens to be in the foreground at the moment. Ah, maybe I'll like, pay attention to what's going on in the clipboard. Uh, and then be real, real careful about what you're putting on the clipboard if you know that it's something secure, and that to, if nothing else, try to get rid of it from the clipboard after a reasonable period of time. Intent extras, you know, you know, I mean, there was a bug that's since been closed, uh, and that where any extras on activities that uh, wound up basically being uh, the, 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 the latest on the task entries and that, I mean, and so it would show up in places like the running task list, any app could get to those extras. Uh, and that, the, that particular problem has been fixed in newer versions of Android, though it still exists in older versions of Android, and you know, there, who knows what other similar bug may be lurking around. Be a little bit careful about what you're passing around in extras. Wearables, you know, we're going to be starting to get into, hey, let's push UIs up to the wearable. That's going to be similar sorts of problems with the remote views. And that where, gee, now, okay, now our notifications and remote views and whatnot and that are effectively going over the air. Um, and that is that going to pose any particular problems since we're not in, responsible for that security. We as a community over time are going to need to be building up more and more stuff. We can't assume that Google's necessarily going to help us lock everything down. Google's interests uh, and that may not necessarily line up with ours. And 
Beyond that, Google's only got so many people uh, and they're working on Android. We like to think that they've got this vast army, um, and that, but I distinctly remember a time when the tools team and that was seriously outnumbered by the contents of this room. Um, even today, it is probably outnumbered by the contents of this room. Um, and that the, so we need more frameworks, more tools to help developers understand what's going on. You know, one thing that I'm kind of interested in poking at is mutation testing for permissions. Um, don't request permissions you don't need. Not only do you not need them, and therefore it's, you know, it's just going to provide comfort to the user, but it's conceivable that that could wind up offering up some sort of an exploit. For example, a manufacturer who shall remain nameless in part because I forget, uh, and that had their device uh, hacked, you know, known, um, and that uh, contest, and that because they had a system installed app that requested the install packages permission. That was a firmware installed app. It could hold that permission. It could download and install apps without you know, any user involvement. The problem is that app didn't need that permission, and it had bugs that then they were able to exploit those bugs to get the app to download other stuff that could then turn around and do whatever the attacker wants. Mutation testing, and there's a, another session on mutation testing in general here at the conference, and that is basically saying, if I have a test suite and I have an app, if I change the app, let's say change plus one to minus one in a calculation somewhere, my test suite darn well better fail. And if it didn't fail, then my test suite isn't complete. It didn't have a test case that covered that particular change. Same thing with permissions. I should be able to go in and selectively remove permissions and my test suite should fail. And that if it does not fail, then either A, my test suite is incomplete, or B, I didn't need that permission in the first place and therefore shouldn't be having it in my manifest anyway. Overall, I'm a big fan of open protocols, federated environments, and that fewer data silos, uh, and that because those silos, if they become popular, become popular for both good and bad. Uh, and that the we ideally we come up with more standards. You know, users are starting to you know clue into the whole little lock icon thing in their web browser indicating security. What is the lock icon for a mobile app? Uh, is there an equivalent? What should it be? What should it mean? How can we let users know about the security level of what's going on in here? Now, at this point in the presentation, you know, convention says that I should say something like one more thing. Um, and that, be, but you know, given the title of my presentation and where I'm delivering this at, uh, I can do something else. Uh, and that this presentation goes to eleven. Um, <laughs> one thing to watch out for is when you're talking to a third-party app, is the third-party app the app you think it is? We're going to implement a app that holds on to encrypted documents. We're going to hold those on internal storage, we're going to put them in IO Cypher or something, we're going to defend it with our lives, we aren't going to try to implement a PDF viewer. We're going to allow a third party PDF viewer to actually render the PDF. Well, if it got access to the PDF, that third party app could do anything we want. So, since this is an enterprise app, we're going to limit the communications. We're going to say there's only this particular vetted set of PDF readers that we're going to support. We're not going to allow the user to view this PDF and anything else. The problem is that your only way of controlling that is by packaging it. You know, I'll only talk to com.adobe.reader or something like that. There may well be a package installed on the device whose package name is com.adobe.reader. Is that Adobe Reader? Is that a modified version of Adobe Reader that will do things that the user or the enterprise will not want? Does it have nothing to do with Adobe Reader and that it is a total piece of malware? Could be any of them. There's ways that you can detect these things, though. As you're aware, all of our apps are digitally signed, either by the debug signing key or when you're shipping in production by a production signing key. We can get at that information at runtime be a package manager. And so therefore we can check signatures. Another thing I've added to that quack security library is a signature utils class, where I've got a check get signature hash method. You provide me a context and a package name, 
and I will give you back an SHA 256 hashed version of the, of the signing key that was used to sign that app. You can then compare that against, say, a pinned value inside of your app in order to say, oh, okay, well, I am expecting that the signing key for com.adobe.reader should look like X. Where you get that hash, you know, if it's, say, for your own internal stuff, you know, key tool can give you that hash. Uh, and then if it's from a, you know, a third party app, you basically, whoever the security team is that's vetting that Adobe Reader isn't going to do anything nasty with your document, can also basically have a little utility that uses the same method to dump that hash that you can then turn around and embed in your app. Or maybe you do the memorization sort of approach, trust on first use. You assume that Adobe Reader is fine, but if at some future point in time that, you know, you, on that same device, you talk to an Adobe Reader and the signature changed, well, maybe somebody got into that device and replaced Adobe Reader with a modified version uh, and, that the, and therefore wound up with a different signature. That, in turn, is good. You can take it a step further if you want. You can hash the whole APK file. You may have heard of the master key vulnerability. That too, I believe, remember that was last year. Um, and that the master key vulnerability boils down to that uh, the zip logic used to create the APK file and the zip logic used to read it were different implementations. And there were scenarios in which you could zip things that you know, would be ignored in some circumstances and paid attention to in others that could cause you problems. Uh, the signing would basically be ignoring any of that extra stuff. And the signing does not cover everything inside of the APK file, like the meta inf folder is not part of the signature. Um, and then, so you could take it the next step and say, all right, I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to hash the whole APK file and compare that against known values. The downside of this is that that's going to change frequently every time there's a new version of that partner app and that there's APK is going to wind up with a different hash, uh, and then so you're going to need to have some way of dealing with that. The signature is going to be more stable, uh, and that the, there are corner cases in that where the signature may be insufficient. So, these sorts of things are stuff that are within reach. None of this stuff requires you to be a crypto expert. None of this stuff requires you to be a security expert. I'm not a security expert. I don't play a security expert on TV. Um, and then the, but we're, I mean, they're the sorts of things that you can do. You can integrate into your process. And then in order to try to lock down your app to make sure that your users are defended against those forces of evil. Questions? I stunned you into silence. <laughs> Either that or you're short on caffeine. Okay. Um, and that the, okay. Um, uh, we're going into another coffee break uh, and that the down uh, back on the first floor uh, and that before heading into the next round of sessions. Uh, and then thank you all for attending. Is that the same code as yesterday? QR code, I hope. Uh, and that the uh, that should be a new QR code. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, it will lead you to speaker deck again with this. Uh, these QR codes are to this, the presentation, not just to my general speaker deck. Uh, Key, it will give me one application key, but 
the, if, you're, if two apps define the same permission with different labels, first one in wins. Uh, and that, and so if say that you know Adobe Reader and maybe some other Adobe product, and that both define the same permission, uh, that description should be a generic Adobe description. And that if the description says you know something particular to say Adobe Reader, and then the user later goes in and installs a different Adobe app that is also requesting that permission, they're going to be prompted with the description for the Adobe Reader one, and that because that was installed first, and that may cause some confusion. Uh, and that the and so if you are going to create custom permissions in addition to the vulnerability stuff that I talked about, you're also going to need to think about scope and what the appropriate language is. And that the if this permission is unique to this app, feel free to use language that's unique to that app. If that permission is going to be something that's going to be more generic, use language that's going to be more generic. Um, and that the what I haven't experimented with is changing that language. Let's say. Uh, Adobe Reader and that we ship with Adobe Reader specific terminology, then the decision is made, no way, we're going to use this permission across the whole Adobe suite. Can Adobe, an update to Adobe Reader, change the description of the permission in such a way that it will affect those later installs? I haven't tried that, and so I would, would hope that's possible, but I can't guarantee it. Um, and that I have no idea whether that data is effectively copied at install time into a separate spot inside of the system and is not refreshed when that application gets updated. Right. Sure. Can I ask you uh, to plug your book really quickly? Sure. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development. 2,600 plus pulse pounding pages. Though if your pulse actually pounds when reading a technical guide, please seek medical help. Um, and that the, uh, this is going to be really hard for you, but can you say that again slowly? Uh, exactly. uh, the Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development. Um, Thank you. And that the more importantly, go to commonsware.com. Um, uh, and that the uh, and that the I sell this on a subscription basis. Uh, you will not find this in stores. Um, and that the um, but it's updated several times a year. Uh, and that the where scription that gives you access to this gives you access to other stuff, office hours, chats, discounts on webinars, a Stack Overflow bump service if your question is lingering and you're not getting the answers you need. Uh, and so forth, um, and that for uh, forty-five dollars US per year. How is it delivered? PDF, EPUB, Mobi, and an APK file that uh, you can install directly. Um, mainly because a EPUB readers from Android suck, um, and that and I wanted to prove that you could actually create an ebook reader that will honor the author of CSS and that without mangling it. Uh, it also has great full text search. I've integrated SQLite FTS uh, 3 or 4, I forget which, um, and that into there, and so lightning fast search uh, for terms. And as you like, type in a class name and that, bam, all the references to that, and then are going to appear uh, uh, in, in a flash. That sounds good. $25 a year. Yep. Cheers. Any thoughts on variables, Android variables? Like what's trends or what's going to happen with that kind of in future? Oh, wearables. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, Android Wear and that has you know been kind of the, the the bomb that's been dropped into the space recently, and that that hadn't been you know I mean other than we knew that Adobe acquired Vim Labs and therefore was probably going to do something beyond glass, uh, and that you know that wasn't you know widely expected, um, and that the. Um, and so, uh, once Wear devices become available, and that'll be, I'm going to dive into those more. And that the wearables in general, it's more so even than pure regular Android devices, it's going to be you know, a mixed bag. There's going to be some that'll be Wear compatible, and there's going to be some that they'll do their own thing. Um, uh, and that, and so the, um, uh, and that, but of course, wearables is an unfortunate moniker because wearables run everything from your Fitbit style things where there's effectively no UI yeah. unless you count LEDs uh, and that the all the way up to like the Omni True Smart and that which is running Android 4, 2 or 4, 3 and that on your wrist um, and that a full installation of Android you can you pop in a micro SIM card and whatnot and then use it for a phone um, and so wearables as a bucket of technologies okay, we happen to wear it on ourselves and that is a kind of a weak connector. 
um, and that you're probably gonna you're gonna see more focus on things that are more extended sensors and that Fitbit style and that versus you know extensions of your smartphone and that ones with the displays and that design to help surface notifications and things like that. So you're gonna see uh, a reorganizing in that where wearables is going to be less of a concept and is going to break down and that just because wearables is a marketing company as much as anything else. So they gotta sell conferences somehow. Yeah, the wearable will be able to tell you about our sensors if my pulse is indeed done. <laughs> yes, exactly, yes. Uh, and that the please read more slowly. Um, uh, and that the, um, and that's so. it. Yes, the Apple haven't, uh, haven't released anything in that area yet. It sounds more I hear they're holding back and building a lot of the sports integration and things like pulse detection. And, 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 and it is probably safe to assume that wearables in general and that will more substantively take off if and when Apple does enter into the space simply because Apple still's got the cool factor. Um, and that the you know that whatever they come out with and that is going to look good. Uh, and that the and so the uh, and that and so I mean uh, I did actually I did a wearables presentation at a conference getting on close to two years ago and that and people looked at me like I was from Mars uh, and that wearables uh, and that the, and I pointed out that I mean we are one Justin Bieber away and that we're wearables being popular um, and that the, because more so than a phone more so than a tablet watches and like our fashion accessories in addition to functionality um, and that and so that's why you know the Moto 360 uh, and that you know hey a smartwatch that's round um, and doesn't look like you've strapped a brick to your wrist um, and that, what a concept. Um, and that, and so it will, uh, Apple's is going to be a sexy device both in terms of functionality and in terms of fit and finish. Uh, and that, and we can assume that the Apple marketing engine in that is going to, again, it's going to blow the doors open on the space, uh, which, you know, all the Android ones and that are going to happily follow along the trail that they're blazing uh, and that, and pick off uh, and that different segments and that, that for whatever reason aren't interested in an iWatch or whatever they want. And Samsung seems to be using Tizen. Yes, they've now switched the, the new generation gears and that are Tizen. Uh, and that how much of that is serious and how much of that is, well, we invested all of this in Tizen. we got to use it somewhere. Oh, well, there, that. We don't necessarily need that to be an Android thing. Um, and that, who knows? Um, uh, and that the... Um, from our standpoint as developers, it simply means that it's, it may, we can write an app, but just like the Pebble, you're not writing an Android app to run on the Pebble, you'd be writing a C app that runs on the Pebble, and maybe having an Android app that talks to it. Um, and that idea, I gotta get started. But also, you've got the issues of, um, uh, and that the same thing with the, with, with the Samsung New Gears, and that the, you're not writing an Android app to run on the gear. You are writing an Android app that can talk to the gear, and if you want your own custom UIs and whatnot for the gear, you are going to be having to you know, write the HTML5 stuff in that, and you're know, using the Tizen framework. Yeah. Uh, uh, cheers, anyway. Sorry for keeping. Scenarios are fine. The problem is that too many developers go to Stack Overflow and they look up, hey, how do I deal with self signed certificates? And they see the answers out there that say, oh, yeah, you create that trust manager that just accepts everything. And then, you know, we completely ignore the incoming certificates and say, yeah, 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 everything's fine. Because it's really easy to write one of those. It's like, you know, maybe 10 lines of code if there's like, you know, line wrapping in that going on. But you've got to be really careful with that. Just in this past week, the US Federal Trade Commission has filed suit against Fandango and Credit Karma, uh, and that specifically for doing this, that they ship apps in production that totally ignore the incoming certificates, that they do SSL, but they've wired up a trust manager that said, yeah, whatever, we'll accept anything. And that, and so the FTC is saying, you know, that's not good, and that, that you could have problems there. And it is going to be a short step from there for, you know, the FTC equivalent here in the UK or other countries, and that to start doing the same thing. 
Now, they're going to tend to go after bigger brands first. Whether or not you're associated with a bigger brand, I can't say. Um, and that, but the do not, do not, do not, do not, do not ship in production code that has a totally brain dead trust manager where you say, yep, if it's a certificate, it must be good. Um, and that because nobody out there would do anything that would be otherwise. Wow. Uh, is there any like minimum level recommended? Like 128 out of 50 still be uh, encryption level or something like that? Uh, bigger is better. Um, uh, and that the, uh, I mean, the, the uh, from an Android standpoint, that would be no different than really your web server recommendations. Uh, and that, and so whatever the current recommended model would be for you know serving up to a web browser would be fine for Android. Um, and that the. Uh, I mean, I don't have all of the numbers memorized, and then I go and look them up when I need to generate a search. Um, and that, but the if, if it's good for the web, it should be fine for your cases. And in some cases, there's things that you can do that's better. To try to help make managing this stuff in Android apps a bit easier, I've been adding some code to my Quack security library. I mean, I actually didn't do an introduction earlier on in that, the, uh, but in case you don't know me, I, and that I wrote the Busy Coder's Guide to Android Development, the first, oldest, and most up-to-date book on Android development. Uh, I've also answered you know, 12,000 or so Stack Overflow questions, and I've published a number of, of the Commons Where Android components, and that's the Quack Libraries. Quack Security is one that is, not surprisingly, focused on security-related issues. One of the things I've added in there is a trust manager builder, a fluent interface for you to be able to create custom trust managers to handle certain scenarios that uh, are reasonably common yet clunky to set up necessarily on your own in Java so that you can then turn around and use those custom trust managers with you know, HTTPS URL connection, OK HTTP, HTTP client if you're still using it, um, those sorts of things to be able to configure your SSL better. So you wind up with code a little bit like this. I can set up a trust manager builder that says, oh, you can't, what I want to do is I want to check for a self-signed certificate. I've loaded in as a raw resource a certificate I want to compare against. Here is the passcode for that uh, certificate uh, store, um, and that the here hard coded because usually these aren't going to come from a user, uh, and that if they are, I accept a, ch a char array rather than a string, so you've got an easier time of wiping out that password from memory if you want. So if it, if we will accept either this self signed certificate or anything that the default trust managers will do. And so the standard Android behavior uh, and that all of the root CAs and that, that it supports will take care of that too. So that way I can maybe use this set of custom trust managers and so forth and that for a variety of operations, not only talking to my own backend web service that I'm using a self-signed certificate for, but also maybe my production app. And then, and then you turn around and you create an SSL context, open up your connection, whether it's HTTPS URL connection, OK, HTTP, or whatever, and then you tell that context, hey, please use this array of trust managers that that builder is building, and it use that SSL socket factory that we get from this context for this connection, and then that connection is going to use these rules for determining whether or not the SSL is valid or not. Yeah, I've got other uh, options in here in that if you want to specifically accept a particular private uh, certificate authority, there's hooks in there for that, and I'm going to be adding other stuff over time. And then, and so, make, so just because you know you're trying to use some self-signed certificate, you don't have to go in and implement the uh, the, the blind do you know accept all uh, you know trust manager, and that the, there are ways whether you do it yourself, use a library like this that you can teach Android relatively easily. Hey, feel free to use this self-signed certificate, and then it will validate against your test servers, staging servers, or as we'll talk about in a little bit, even possibly your production servers that are using a self-signed server. What we're really worried about with the certificate validation are the so-called man-in-the-middle attacks. And that, uh, though you're welcome to substitute other values for that first N and that if you don't want to be considered sex and arrest them for having child porn. 
in order to be able to uh, set them up for a fall. The problem is that doing the security stuff is oftentimes not that easy. That QR code leads to a white paper published last year. A bunch of academic researchers well, created a tool called CryptoLint. Lint, as you're aware, and that is looking at a code base and saying, okay, what have you done that is technically legal from a compilation standpoint, but probably not what you want? CryptoLint is focused specifically on common flaws in cryptography, such as hard coding the password. Um, and that the, they analyzed nearly 12,000 Android applications and found that 88% of them were screwing up in one form or fashion in things that CryptoLint was able to detect. So look to the person to your left, look to the person to your right, two-thirds percent chance that all three of you have screwed up something, uh, and that with security. And so what my goal here is today is to basically try to point out different areas and that that you should be thinking about, where possible show you easy ways of dealing with those things that you should be thinking about so that you can do a better job and that of securing your users. If there is one thing you take away from this presentation, please use SSL. Um, and that the, uh, and that if, I mean, just do it. In part because normally it just works. You know, if you've got your web server set up, you stick the little S on that at the end of your scheme, and then and poof, magic crypto happens. The problems come in and that where it's not quite that straightforward. For example, you want to uh, have a test server somewhere, uh, and uh, you've got some sort of a self-signed SSL certificate for that test server, well, self-signed certificates are going to fail out of the box. And so you need to go in and do a little bit of work in order to be able to arrange to support those self-signed certificates. Your organization may be big enough that you have your own private certificate authority and that you're not necessarily using certs that are backed by some common root certificate authority, you know, your verisigns and whatnot of the world, but instead is back to your organization, principally for, you know, internal use apps and things like that, your intranets and so forth. Well, those certificates aren't going to be valid, uh, determined as valid, because, you know, the Java slash Android code is going to try validating all these certificates, and it's going to come to the end, and it's going to say, but, 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 I don't recognize any of that stuff, ick, and it's going to fail. And so you've got to do stuff with, you know, custom trust managers in order to be able to teach Android that no, 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 if for my app, these scenarios started, and we'll see if anyone else uh, and that uh, manages to show up. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Mark Murphy, and I'm here to talk to you about securing your Android applications. Um, most of you hopefully have done some Android development before, uh, and that the, if you haven't, some of the... Sorry, wrong, wrong point. <laughs> Was that something I said? No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, unfortunately that significantly reduced the size of my audience by a noteworthy percentage. Um, and that the, uh, uh, the, um, so anyway, I mean, the, uh, if you haven't done Android development, and there are many of the concepts that I'll talk about here and that will be applicable to other environments in one form or fashion, uh, and that though some of the technical implementations that I'll talk about may somewhat flip past your head. Uh, and that the uh, and that so um, it, so it should be useful for all of you. The, the degree of usefulness uh, and that is certainly very. Uh, a couple of administrative things uh, and that if you could take your phones and put them on vibrate or silent or forward them to 10 Downing Street or whatever you normally do when you don't want to be disturbed, that'd be awesome. Um, if you have questions anywhere along the way, just let me know, uh, and that don't feel you have to wait till the end. Um, and that the uh, this is being recorded, I presume. I've got a little red light showing at me. Hi, camera. Um, and that and so uh, and that so also bear that in mind if you do decide to you know escape somewhere along the line. 
Also, uh, and that you are all given thumb drives, which have a presentation on them that vaguely resembles the one that I'm going to be showing you here. Uh, but they asked for that presentation deck uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was editing these slides yesterday. Um, and that there is going to be a QR code in the short URL at the end for you to be able to download the actual slides that I'm going to be using here, which are both new and improved. But we're here today to talk about defending your users against the forces of evil. Um, and that the, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about here will have other utility. Uh, and that, that you are you worried about, um, you know, you've got uh, multimedia assets and that, that you want to protect using some sort of DRM-ish algorithm um, and that, or things along those lines. Some of what I'll talk about here will have some relevance there, but that's not really the point. I'm worried about our users because our users are awash in a sea of evil. Um, and that whether it is you know, lighter weight things like your garden variety script kitties, uh, and that up to you know, more serious concerns, some of which change over time. For example, I mean, there was just an article in Australia's The Age. Uh, and that uh, just the past few days, and that talking about how spyware is increasingly being used, uh, you know, I mean, in domestic violence and other sorts of situations where you know, people are downloading the nanny cams and you know the track your children sorts of apps and that, and while the use of those apps for those specific use cases is reasonable, using that to track your ex stalk, you know, the celebrity, that sort of stuff, and that starts becoming much more disturbing. And of course, you know, a lot of people in that are going to be thinking about that last bullet, state actors. Um, you're probably thinking that I'm thinking about, you know, a particular group of five state actors uh, and that have been in the news over the past year or so and that for uh, wide-scale surveillance and so forth. Um, they are certainly state actors to pay attention to and keep tabs on what it is that is being disclosed that they are doing. Um, but there are other state actors, uh, and that beyond those five. Even if you think that those five and that are, are righteous and just in what they're doing, the notion that there are other state actors who you may not like nearly so much that aren't, you know, are also <coughs> doing those same sorts of things. Even if they can't necessarily do it on an international basis, they can certainly do it within their own borders. You know, just within you know, the past few months and that, you know, we've had the whole you know, turkey banning of Twitter and whatnot and blocking things left and right. It's a short hop from there to being able to more surveil and you know, try to use those sorts of things to figure out, okay, well these are particular dissidents uh, and that, that we are going to pressure uh, and that because they're not as high profile, we want to shut them up in the Ukraine and that earlier this year there was that handy little text message that went out to lots of people saying hi your cell phone was seen in the vicinity of a protest of the other day have a nice day um, and that and it is a very short step from there for that turning around and being used uh, at that for rounding up people on mass and so the, now, if you're writing the next Flappy Bird clone, uh, and that you probably aren't going to be panicking about this stuff quite so much, and that unless you know you're here to save the birds, um, and that the, but there are going to be any number of apps where we need to think long and hard about you know how are we making sure that the user's data is the user's data and stays the user's data and doesn't become the user's and in other parties' data that we are ensuring that their data isn't sniffed in transit, it isn't absconded with off their devices, it isn't, uh, and then modified, uh, and that you know, go in and tinker with that data in ways that might uh, negatively affect the user, such as, oh, hey, we're going to go in and we're going to load a bunch of child porn onto this person's phone, and then turn around 